Well, thank you for inviting me. And uh, interestingly, Kevin started off by saying, uh, I'm giving a warts and all uh, talk. So he's obviously a closet dermatologist there. Because very often in dermatology, we start off sort of apologizing, Cinderella specialty. Um, but if I were to undress you all now and scrutinize your skin, I would find skin abnormalities in about 60% and treatable skin problems in about 33%. So skin problems are incredibly important and the last general practitioner morbidity statistics suggested that skin diseases are now the commonest reason for a new consultation in general practice. And interestingly, Rachel Dean in the last session uh, showing the most frequent uh, causes of uh, uh, um, uh, visiting a vet, skin was up there at the top. So a little, you know, skin doesn't kill people, I'm not pretending that, but a little bit of harm affecting a lot of people can often add up to far more in absolute terms uh, than a few fatal conditions. But I'm not going to talk about dermatology really today. Um, I, I want to make it more general because I live in a funny world. You know, a lot of my life, uh, I'm living in the world of trying to produce uh, relatively, uh, I hope, helpful Cochrane systematic reviews on skin problems or indeed uh, uh, addressing those uncertainties by doing uh, national clinical trials. So I live in this world and normally when I'm talking, I'm talking about critical appraisal of the evidence. But I also have a foot in the other camp. And for some of my work in the week, I'm an ordinary consultant clinical dermatologist. And that's the dirty side. And, and, and I love that sort of tension and um, difficulty, if you like, of, well, how do I go from there, the internal validity of there, to here? So I'm going from the cleanish paper to the realities of a dirty, difficult, mixed, problematic clinic. And that's the theme uh, of my short session with you. And I, like Kevin, actually, I've always um, had this philosophy that evidence-based medicine starts with a patient encounter that generates a question, not thinking, oh, what should we look up? But you start in the clinic, you go and search, and then you apply it back to that same patient. So if we're talking about the clinic, let's go to the clinic. There's nothing like patience to bring your uh, uh, head out of the clouds uh, and onto the ground. So there we are. I'm seeing, I uh, have a particular interest in childhood eczema. This little child asking me, tell me, Professor Williams, how effective is topical permecrolimus in treating my eczema? <laughs> well, in a recent systematic review, compared with vehicle, that's cream or grease, at three weeks, the rate ratio for investigator global response for five pool studies using a random effects model was 2.72, 95% confidence interval 1.84 to 4.83. Good answer. What's that in plain English, Professor? Well, it means that it's better than grease. So how does it compare to steroid creams? Ooh, that's a toughie. Uh, one study suggests that 50% were clear or almost clear on topical steroids compared with 11% on topical pimecrolimus. So if I use topical betamethasone, that's a steroid, would I be in that 50% that gets better? It's a good question, isn't it? You do ask some more school. What it means is that on average, people similar to you will become clear around half of the time. So what are the long-term safety effects? We often uh, skip out on safety, don't we? <laughs> Have you swallowed the Cochrane Library or something? It seems to be safe, but we're not really sure without long-term studies. You don't know very much to a professor, do you? I think I'll stick to home remedies. So there's nothing quite like facing and talking to real patients in the clinic. So welcome to my field. Um, so we have around 2,000 skin conditions, and like the old Pareto principle, around 80% uh, of our consultations are made up by 10 groups of conditions. Uh, we have over 250 specialist dermatology journals. and uh, Most of our Cochrane Skin Group reviews contain around 5 to 20 ropey randomized control trials. There are some exceptions, but generally. And evidence-based medicine or dermatology is picking up. 
Um, and I get really irritated by the question from my colleagues. Saying, what's the evidence, Howell, that, um, you know, what's the evidence that evidence-based medicine works? And it's as if, you know, there's a, a dichotomy of clinicians out there. Um, those that, you know, uh, practice evidence-based dermatology and those who do not. And it's ridiculous. I mean, nobody, no dermatologist or, or, or clinician goes out, sets out to deliberately practice non-evidence-based medicine. So how can you make a comparison? It's a continuum. Some people do it better than others, and some people are more willing to learn. But it's, it's impossible to dichotomize and compare. Uh, we are quite heavily influenced by pharmaceutical-based medicine. That's beginning to change a little, but it's still uh, quite a powerful uh, influence in dermatology. So, really, what I, I wanted to dwell on, and very little is written about this, there's a lot on internal validity and bringing evidence together, but how do you apply that evidence, aggregate information to individuals? And these are some things that uh, seem to be quite important in my practice to consider when applying evidence from trial. So, is my patient sufficiently similar, not identical, sufficiently similar? What about the outcomes? Can I understand them? What about the magnitude of the benefit? Is it clinically worthwhile? And what about the drawbacks that are often hidden? And does it fit into my patient's beliefs? A time for voting here. I mean, they're all maybe important for you. Which of these is most important to you? If you had to make a choice of the most important thing, would you press one to five now, please? Wow. I, I, I told myself before this talk, don't look at this and say that's interesting. <laughs> But that's interesting. <laughs> no, honestly, because when I do a lot of teaching, very few people put the magnitudes. It was a very mature, different audience we were today. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, uh, finding there. Okay, so let's deal with these in turn. Are the patients in the trial, so this paper, you know, I've just published this paper, are the patient, is the patient here sufficiently similar and they may differ in simple biological ways, disease subtype? Social factors may diminish concordance, other comorbidities, um, baseline risk. So in, in my field of eczema, for example, if I wanted to uh, uh, decide what was the best treatment for this child with atopic eczema, irritant, possibly secondary infection, how confident would I be extrapolating from this study of German women treated with UVA? I probably wouldn't be happy because the etiological factors may be uh, too different. But in some circumstances, they, they may be sufficiently similar. Disease subtype. So this is psoriasis, the common type of psoriasis. And this is a, a variety called palmoplantar pastulosis. I even believe it's a different condition. I'm not happy jumping from a trial of acetretin in Clark psoriasis to this condition. You may be, and that's fine, as long as you've thought about it. Comorbidities. Typically, the people in clinical trials are uh, unusually healthy and atypical, and this lady with a lentigo malignant melanoma also has renal carcinoma and renal failure. Would I use the same chemotherapeutic agents in her? Probably not. And baseline risk and treatment response. There I am in secondary care. Ah, I can do wonders for your uh, uh, severe acne with a drug called isotretinoin. But what about primary care? He's still complaining of something, but he has far less to gain. And very nicely put here by uh, a slide by Tony Kendrick in the, in the BMJ. Typically, um, risk of an adverse event, say, for example, irritation from uh, benzoyl peroxide, which has been out for years for treating acne. I mean, the, the, the rate of irritation is more or less the same, whether you've got severe acne or mild acne. But your ability to respond in terms of benefit will vary according to how severe you are. So if you're down here, the ratio of risk to benefit uh, will vary dramatically. So baseline risk is a, a, another thing to take into account. Okay, so we've talked about how similar the patients are to yours. What about the outcomes? Outcomes, outcomes. What a mess. Scales. Like we live in a world of scales. What does a change of 10 points mean? And there are so many of them. You can deliberately choose scales to enhance the effects that you want to show. And what about the time period? And what's wrong with asking patients? Let me elaborate. 
scales in dermatology, we often have sort of thickening and redness and cracking and extent, you know. So do you multiply by extent or add by extent? And what are the properties of these scales? You know, does a, a PASI score of 30 for psoriasis, does it mean twice as bad as a score of 15? Usually not, they're non-linear scales and they have thresholds that have been little investigated. Some of the outcomes we look at there now may not be clinically relevant. This is a, not a bad trial. This is a trial of topical minoxidil. Minoxidil, if you remember, was a, an oral antihypertensive agent that uh, made people a bit more hairy. And they thought, oh, this may be good for female pattern hair loss, which is a really very distressing uh, condition, believe me. And not a bad little trial. And they were looking at the uh, a density of hair in a little shaved area, a trichogram and they showed something was happening compared with placebo in the minoxidil. Uh, those who used vehicle, there was a better growth, P equals not for not M. Although subjects, I hate that with subjects, subjects discern no difference between the treatment groups. Now, they should have stopped there. They couldn't resist. They had to go on. And then they concluded 2% minoxidil appears to be effective in the treatment. And I have this vision of these angry women uh, complaining at this salesperson saying, ah, but the p-value was 0.05. In terms of a clinically relevant outcome, it meant nothing uh, to those women who participated in that study. And similar uh, um, outcome measures in my own field of eczema. Uh, this is Jochen Schmidt's uh, systematic review. There are about 50 scales there, 20 of which are named scales. Uh, only three have been tested. And just testing a scale doesn't mean it's passed the test. So just because you've uh, you know, taken a driving test doesn't mean you've passed the driving test. Um, and we need an international consensus. And that has started the harmonizing outcome measures for eczema. Uh, we're being helped by the OMER Act people. But at the moment, every two years, I go to an international uh, symposium on uh, eczema or atopic dermatitis. And we have this uh, vision like the Tower of Babel. Everyone is shouting at each other. And these are the actual names of the scales. Scorad, Sassad, give me a poem, a Dazi tonight, I got a bad headache, etc., etc. Et <laughs> so that's the situation at the moment. When we go to an international collection of uh, evidence on uh, eczema, we're all shouting at each other, but nobody understands each other. Now, time periods for skin disease. So here we have somebody with chronic plaque psoriasis, and I would like to ask you, without giving you any more information, it's another interactive question. Most of the trials are quite short-term, six weeks. Is six weeks an appropriate period to assess uh, efficacy of a new cream in psoriasis? One for yes, two for no. Please vote. Yeah, and why not? Because... This is a chronic disease. It's with you. I mean, it doesn't come and go and sort of last for six weeks. It's a typically a chronic condition that lasts many years. It can go into remission. And when, again, we've looked systematically at the sort of uh, epidemiology, if you like, of clinical trials by the European Dermatoepidemiology Network, uh, uh, we find that only 7% were longer than four months. So that's failing our, our patients and our community. And that's starting to change now. That, that message has got through. And with the new biologics, we're seeing one-year studies which are far, far more appropriate. So there's some uh, cause for hope there. And why are we so afraid of asking patients what they think? Why do we have to invent all these complicated and elaborate skills, which sound very precise, don't they? They have an air of spurious precision when you put a number and two decibel points on it. But what on earth do they mean? Why not ask our patients? So we did a survey of uh, 125 trials from the top five dermatology journals, and patient-rated outcomes were only present in a quarter of those trials. And they were often buried in the tables or not highlighted in the abstract. Uh, and again, rather shockingly, only 14% of those trials declared their main outcome measure beforehand. Oh, yes, and the evening primrose oil story. And again, it uh, is an example of, of, of looking at many outcomes and the danger of selective reporting outcome bias. <coughs> so this was a, a, an old uh, meta-analysis done by the industry, nine trials, many, many outcomes looked at, and then highlighted in the abstract was that doctor assessed itch. <laughs> How could doctor assess itch? <laughs> uh, it was highly significant at eight weeks, and it's a bit like uh, throwing a dart and then uh, drawing a dartboard around where the, uh, the, the dart lands. 
So we've talked a little bit about the outcomes. What about the magnitude of benefit? And you're all onto this, but a lot of my colleagues are not. They just look to, ah, but it was significant. The, the whole world is divided into NS and, and significant. Well, what about the magnitude of that gain? And is your patient as impressed as you are? And there have been some nice studies in the BMJ looking at patients' views of uh, anticoagulation uh, and risk of stroke compared with what doctors thought, uh, and, and the value is different. Number needed to treat and triumph of the aggregate. Let me elaborate. Magnitude of benefit. Here we are. This is a lady who saw me with psoriasis on her legs. And I treated her with a, a, a cream called Dithranol, uh, anthrolin in the US. And um, I said, just put it on one leg. And uh, uh, when she came uh, back to see me, this is what she looked like now. Uh, and this is not a catch question. It was the left leg she was treating. <laughs> So, um, do you think now, put yourself in the legs of that lady, um, do you think that that magnitude of benefit is clinically worthwhile? One, yes, two, no. Mm, that's interesting. Well, um, I, I was very happy, and if I did the score on her leg for erythema, thickness, and scaling, it was a 70% reduction compared with the other leg. Ooh, wow. Sorry, she was looking very miserable. Why was she miserable? What couldn't she do? Skirt, absolutely. She wanted to wear a skirt. So her patient-centered objective wasn't to get a 70% reduction in PASI, which looked good on the clinical trials. She had a, a personal objective, and that was she hadn't worn a skirt for about eight or nine years. It was always tracksuit or tights, and she wanted to play netball again. So I treated her with systemic therapy, methotrexate, and it worked a treat, and she played basketball again, and, uh, uh, and everything uh, went well. And she, in, interestingly, she's since stopped it. Um, but it just goes to show um, magnitude for us may not be the same for our patients. Probiotics for atopic eczema, another good uh, example of small differences. So this is the uh, uh, review here of 13 trials. Um, a 6.64 uh, point intergroup difference is at the end of the studies on a scale of 0 to 103. And the difference between the change in difference of the groups is just 1.37. Is that clinically significant? Probably not. Triumph of the aggregate. Now, this is something that perplexes me and has done others for a while, and that is going from group data to the individual, and I sort of hinted it, uh, at it without uh, baby asking me that question. And I'm going to tease you a bit here now. Let me take you through this slide. Um, this is standard treatment, and this is a new treatment, and this is a disease score. Would any fit it to whatever uh, area you're working in? And um, this is a, a sort of score below which the disease actually gets worse, and this gets better here. Now, Supposing this was, um, uh, well, the mean improvement is the same in both groups, okay? It's five points. So both groups, on average, improve by five points. It's not just a case of looking at the mean response. You have to look at the spread of response. And when you see information on biologics, for example, in psoriasis, and they have wonderful effects there, some of those patients you'll treat will actually get worse. Some will have be better for two years, and they'll make it into the Daily Mail. But there is a spread of treatment responses that you have to be aware of. Yes, and it brings me back to my own experience. So I've had um, a, a torn supraspinatus tendon, and earlier this year I had uh, subacromial decompression. I couldn't follow a lovely team of uh, orthopedics. I couldn't ask for nicer, better service in the NHS. And I was awake during the uh, operation. Everyone else went to sleep with midazolam, but I was talking to, to the dozen about the comparative anatomy of... Uh, 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 imagine, imagine living with me. Anyway, um, so, uh, you know... <laughs> Uh, but looking at the studies, two or three studies out there suggest that it may be compared with physio, and the surgeon said, you know, 85% of people get better. Oh, I thought, I wonder if I'll be in that 85%. And of course, I'm, I'm not, not really, not, I'm about eight months on now. I'm slightly worse, perhaps, or, or just about the same. And I'm not complaining, because I made an informed choice on that. But it just reinforces the issue of that 85% figure, you know, 85% of people get better. That means 15% maybe be the same or worse. And, and that's something that's very important to get across when uh, translating aggregate data to individuals. And 
It's not a chance thing either. It's not like an 85% chance you'll get better. It's not as if the surgeon is rolling a dice there and my destiny will be determined by that roll of the dice. The micropathology which resulted in me getting better or not better was already there. It's not known to the medical profession yet what those predictors are and perhaps personalized medicine will go some way towards predicting that. But it's not a chance thing. It is actually determined there at that time the operation was done. Anyway the aggregate. So what about the adverse effects? Often uh, uh, thought about last of all, why did the patients drop out? Did they drop out because they dropped dead? Or did they drop out because the uh, treatment was so effective they didn't want to bother coming back? And what about rare side effects like pigmentation or lupus syndrome in minocycline, which do not show up in the clinical trials? And how do you communicate that risk? Again, you know, in the clinic, let's get back to the clinic. Here we have a pushy mother saying, I want my baby to have cyclosporin, Professor Williams. I've read all about it. Here's a wadge of stuff. And I look at this child with mild atopic eczema that hasn't, hasn't really been treated properly. And I see a tube of uh, uh, pathetically weak hydrocortisone with one thumbprint on the tube. And so I say to the mother, cyclosporin, I say, Ooh, I wouldn't recommend that. It can damage the kidneys and you have to the blood pressure. Ja, da, 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 da. Oh, all right then, all right then. Uh, whereas if I see another child and the parents aren't pushy at all and the child is oh, suffering terrible with severe eczema, uh, scratching infection, uh, not responding to maximal top of therapy, I say, right, I think it's time now we went and, and chose systemic therapy. Um, I've been using this for 30 years and as long as we monitor it, it's quite safe. Isn't it interesting how how we can turn side effects at our convenience, uh, what is it called, framing bias. Uh, I think we do it sometimes for the right reasons, but uh, uh, sometimes we do it as a sort of a weapon or a threat to get the patients to comply with what we want. Uh, but communicating risk is a whole issue in itself. And fitting in, I and mean, we're talking about shared decision making and the reality of the clinic, what about um, how does your uh, suggestions fit in with your patient's values? What is their prior belief about the treatment? Have they had a cousin who's had a really good result with isotretinoin or a bad result? Uh, do they prefer topical or systemic? Uh, there may be cultural differences there. Would they prefer no treatment at all? Have they just come for information? And what have they had before? And how do they balance the pros and cons? So I'll just tell you a little story here of a, a, a lady that uh, I was looking after at King's College Hospital. And she had a basal cell carcinoma, quite a large one on her temple. And um, radiotherapy would have been the obvious uh, uh, choice of treatment, quite a large one, tricky to do with the surgery there. But she begged me not to send her to the radiotherapy center because six months earlier she had lost her husband there. So going to the radiotherapy was like an anniversary of all the uh, uh, tragic events that she was struggling to come over. So we changed, well, this is what the evidence suggests. Well, actually, so we talked to the plastic surgeons. She had it done under a local anesthetic and she was fantastic. She had a good response and was a very happy person. That just goes to show how individual preferences and beliefs may modify uh, uh, the uh, treatment choice under the shared decision-making model. So uh, these are, there, there may be more, uh, little is written about this, but these are things to ask when applying trial results to your patients. How similar are the patients to the patient in front of you? Not identical, are they similar enough? Did the outcomes make any sense to you? If not, write in and complain. What about the magnitude of the benefit, given that it was statistically significant? Was it clinically worthwhile? And what about the adverse effects, which you have to go sniffing for in the paper in order to draw them out? And finally, applying that, does it fit in with your patient's belief and values? And uh, again, uh, one of the things I like to use in the clinic, and uh, this is a Welsh milking stool, and I've got one of these in my clinic because it, again, brings, and I've heard it in several times today, the sort of trilogy of the external evidence, the clinician or healthcare professional and the patient. And I, I say this to the children because some of the children are, are quite manipulative, you know, and uh, they are looking there with a w wicked smile there, you know. And so I say to them, you know, if, if it's you versus the creams and me and your parents, the stool will fall over. And we give this demonstration. But if we're all working together, then we can go further forward. Thank you very much.
you were surprised with the results of the poll. So I'm curious, what, what's the one that you find most important? Um, yes, I, I was surprised by the um, amount of people who put magnitude of benefit, which I, I think reflects the majority of the audience, because normally um, if I talk about uh, generalizing evidence to my own sort of trainees, um, they tend to just focus on was the result statistically significant or not. And that's clearly important as a starting point, uh, but they then don't look uh, further ahead. Uh, so in one of our journal clubs, there was uh, something about leflunamide from psoriasis, and one of our specialist registrars was very enthusiastic about adopting it. And uh, of course, when you looked at the trial, yes, it was a massive trial, but the, the, the change between the uh, scores was tiny, so unlikely to be clinically worthwhile, especially when balanced against cost and adverse effects. So I was a bit surprised by that, but perhaps not, given that uh, uh, we're in evidence 2011 here. How do you deal with colleagues that have very different um, applications of the evidence with all those different um, selections that you can make? Well, you know, I, I see, uh, coming back to Kevin and, and, and to the um, veterinary world, I, I think that the adoption of, of um, a new uh, way of practicing is, is, is can be thought of in a, a complex adaptive system in that it's there are little increments and, and then suddenly something changes. Something changed in dermatology about four years ago. I don't know what it was. I, and, and all sorts of people, even the most sort of skeptical people, started saying the word evidence, evidence, often inappropriately, of course. Um, but I, I don't feel I'm sort of pushing or struggling anymore. They really are interested in what's happening now. Uh, and I don't think that's across the board. I don't think it's across the world. But, but something suddenly happened. There was like a critical mass movement. And it's probably as a result of a complex system just uh, shifting over. So I, I hope that happens in other disciplines as well. Great. Well, th well let's thank um, Professor Williams again for the great talk. Thank you.